hello everyone. Welcome back to yet another one of our CAT seminar series. Today we have Professor Richard Towers. He's a professor here at UIUC, both the mathematics and the industrial engineering departments. And he's going to talk to us about data, mobility, and traffic today. So let's give him a warm Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Um, this is the first time I've been here. I'm really impressed. So this is a, a little bit of a mishmash. I'm in two departments, industrial and enterprise systems engineering, and also mathematics. And um, the, the goal here, or rather, several years ago, I started to uh, be interested in traffic. I guess you could say that intellectually I got stuck in traffic. But uh, I started to think about with a a number of other people, how to think about, let's say, traffic patterns and how to use um, some mathematical tools to understand some large-scale, let's say, traffic behavior. And a number of these, the results I'm going to talk about are still in progress, they're, they're still developing, the story isn't finished yet, but um, I think they're going in some interesting directions. So that's sort of what we're going to be talking about today. All right, so I need not say what's on these next two slides, but I'll say it anyways. Transportation is undergoing a generational disruption and uh, there are some data-related traffic questions. Cities are releasing sizable data sets through data portals. What are some of the interesting citywide data questions which can help them make decisions? Okay, and sort of the, some of the background thoughts here are that uh, we're going to be seeing rapid change, massive changes in, in traffic behavior. And can we develop some tools which will allow us to understand or compare some cities to understand maybe what's going right and what's going wrong um, through the, the huge amounts of data that we're going to be seeing? Will, can we help one city compare itself to a different city? Um, so. As transportation becomes more connected, we need ways to understand the consequences. So, um, I'm going to be talking about three things, and some of these are a little bit, uh, let's say, novel, but that's what we do in academia. I'm going to be talking about the geometry of congestion. Um, I'm, I got interested in sort of thinking about traffic jams, but large citywide um, ways of understanding congestion. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell a, a story using some, some uh, mathematics that's involved or that's being used for topological data analysis uh, in other fields. The second thing is behavioral decomposition of road use and uh, we'll do some matrix factorization. There will be some math there, but this actually, the import of this is we're using the math to say some other interesting things. Okay, and then thirdly, um, I'm going to talk about time for accidents, um, or rather I'm going to look at the trade-off between time and accidents, okay? So the goal of this, these things, once again, is to bring in some um, mathematical tools so that we can understand large-scale behaviors of traffic. Okay, all right. Um, can we identify robust traffic behavior? This is another way to, to look at it. And this is an old headline, New York City goes after Uber and Lyft, and this was from 2018, I guess. Um, I guess the, the question here is, as cities and, and whatever impose restrictions on Uber and whatever, can we actually figure out what's happening? Um, can we develop some sophisticated understanding of things? And can we understand what's maybe robust in traffic behavior? Okay, and the starting point here is, at least for a number of things that I'm going to be talking about, is estimates of traffic speeds and counts by Donovan and Work. And uh, uh, Dan Work was at University of Illinois for a number of years, and they did a Freedom of Information Act origin and destination, or they used the Freedom of Information Act to get some origin destination data from New York City taxi cabs, and they found some traffic speeds which were commensurate with data, and that's sort of um, the starting point of a bunch of things, so let's actually go over that. I went to Google Maps and uh, printed out what 
the, the optimum way to get from Champaign to here, and the data said that it takes 20 minutes. Okay, let's say that I actually took a taxi from Champaign to here, and it did take 20 minutes, okay? And what we're interested, or what they did, is they reverse engineered a lot of data from a lot of taxi trips, okay? So, sort of the short story is let's randomly guess a speed along that road, or a speed along that road, and a speed along that road, and, um, oh, what's your favorite number between 0 and 10? 8? Okay. Let's say that I would randomly guess that the speed along that road is 8, and what's your favorite number between 0 and 10? 7. 7, okay. Let's say that the speed along there was 7 miles an hour, okay? And if I think about it, um, their guesses, well, if I would guess all the, the speeds along the roads, then it probably might not match up to 22 minutes travel time. Okay, well, and maybe I'm not, maybe I have not only my traffic, my uh, trip data, but data from a whole bunch of other people going from, oh, St. Joseph to up uh, there, Dewey and Prospect, and I have just all sorts of trips. And I can start to see, well, their guesses weren't really right, so let's try to fix them up in a way that actually matches lots of trips that we see. Okay, and if you do that, um, you can sort of keep on guessing and iterating and guessing and iterating until you get some sort of idea of traffic speeds along a whole bunch of routes. Uh, there's an optimization problem and uh, you got to have enough data, you got to have all sorts of things, but it's a reasonable start, okay? And it's um, with enough taxi data, well, you can sort of hope for a unique minimum, okay? It's a guess, but it's what we can do with publicly available data, okay? All right, so we, we also are assuming that the taxi ride that I took from Champagne, or the, the virtual taxi ride that it took from Champagne to here was uh, along an optimal route according to whatever guesses you take, okay? We're assuming that everyone acts in a, you know, tries to route along the fastest path, okay? All right, there's a story there. That's not the main story that we want to talk about, though. So, what I'm interested in here at the moment is using some of that data to understand the geometry of traffic congestion, okay, and this is by a whole bunch of people, and sort of the story is that um, I'd like to understand how, well, the effect of traffic jams, the effect of congestion, and how that fits, fits into the question of, well, I want to go from here to there, okay, all right, how connected, okay, is traffic? Uh, or, or is a street network. And uh, I'll tell you a story in a moment, um, but the word network theory is sort of important here. This is not surprising. I want to actually, and a number of other people have used network theory to study roads uh, and traffic, but I want to bring in a slightly different tool, which I'll tell you the, the reason for in a couple of minutes. But, uh, okay. Um, our setup, we, we have the data from, from uh, New York City, so we're going to look at some uh, traffic speeds from the Diamond District. And we're going to do it between 9 and 10 a.m. and work days between June, July, and August of 2011. That means that it's fairly homogenous in time. And if we have missing data, which you know we have, we can sort of average and fill it in. All right? Um, what we're interested in here is spatial fluctuations, not really time fluctuations. We've assume that everything is homogenous in time, we're interested in is that road over there slower than this road over here, and what's the, the implication of that? All right, so um, the data is that there's 152 one directional lengths, 144 roads, and we're using OpenStreetMap, so there are some hiccups in that, but let's, uh, this is sort of a test case, there are eight two-way roads, and we have 66 days in it, and basically what I'm interested in doing is taking an average speed, okay, so along the link on, you know, 
Broadway between 4th and 5th Street, I want, I want to take the average speed over all of those days, 66 days, okay? So between 9 and 10 a.m., the speed that I'm looking at on Broadway between 3rd and 4th, or wherever, is the average speed, okay? Now, here is the picture, all right? Um, the green roads are fast, the red roads are slow. Um, let's see, is that right? The red, yeah, okay. The red roads are slow, the orange roads are better, the blue are even better, and the green roads are fast. Okay. Um, You sort of see uh, an interesting picture here, right? It's uh, fairly easy to go north-south, or from the southwest to northeast, um, but if you want to go that direction, uh, northwest to southeast, things are a little bit more congested. You're really sort of jammed up over there, right? So, and up here there's a little pocket where you can get from anywhere to anywhere along blue roads. Okay, so what's the story here? This is a test case, but sort of one can envision a larger story here. Wow, um, yeah, what's the topological picture of this road network and how can we sort of capture some idea that we, you know, can go in certain directions, not in other directions, and we're stuck here and we can move freely there. Okay. All right. So, this is actually sort of something that connects with something in mathematics called persistent homology, and uh, I'll tell you, I'll show you some pictures in a moment, and there's some complicated stuff, which I'll... Uh, which we're not going to focus on, but uh, there's some stuff which we can actually see what's going on. This is uh, part of a growing field of topological data analysis and computational topology. Okay, and the story here that's connected that maybe connects with some of the things that you've seen in some of your own work is uh, it's unfolding. So. A mechanical engineer thinks about bifurcations, okay, they have an ODE with a stable point and what they do is they fiddle a little bit with the dynamics near the stable point and they unfold the fixed point and with that they understand better the nature of the fixed point, okay? So this is sort of something similar. What we're going to do is we're going to think about an extra parameter here and using an extra sort of parameter we're going to unfold this notion of congestion. Okay? All right. So forget about the, let's just focus on the top. The background or the classic example of this tool is you have a, uh, a point cloud. Okay? And actually this is now even more relevant for, for uh, this, this uh, audience because LIDARs basically generate point clouds, right? Uh, that's sort of what a lot of the you know, the technology that's actually being used in autonomous vehicles, the, the spinning LIDARs, okay? And what they actually get is a, what they produce is a point cloud, okay? And then from that point cloud, you want to reverse engineer what's going on, okay? All right, so that's something to just keep in the back of your mind, but sort of the story here that uh, I want to tell is you have a bunch of points, and what we're going to do is we're going to start to, let's say, connect nearby points. And by nearby points, I'm going to have a tuning parameter that says nearby is within some little ball epsilon. And as I get my little, make my little ball larger and larger, I start to connect more points. Okay. And then this whole network starts to fill in. Okay. So once again, the picture here is I have a bunch of points, and I'm saying I'm going to enlarge the points, okay, and I'm going to keep track then of when the ball around this point and the ball around this point intersect, okay, and when they intersect, that's when I'm sort of kind of sure that I actually have an object, 
okay? And you can think about that in terms of LIDARs, right? You, you take your bunch of points and you know where they are in XYZ space, then you start to enlarge them, and when things start to overlap and you start to get connected components, then you realize that there's actually a three-dimensional object there, okay? All right, we're gonna use that technology a little bit, but uh, in a different way, and what that does then is that's transformed into something that's called a barcode, which is not the same sort of thing that you see at Walgreens. This is a topological barcode. And what these little lines mean, we aren't going to go into the details, but like uh, each one of these lines is a different connected component. Okay, so as I let my little balls grow and things merge, I keep track of the developing object, and I have an x direction in my, or an x axis which tells me how, what happens with my enlarging parameter, and this tells me which object I'm dealing with, and you can sort of envision that, for example, if I have a point cloud from him, okay, of, of uh, you know, my LiDAR sees him and I start to enlarge the balls, Okay, I might see an arm, and I might see a leg, and then sooner or later, these legs and arms are going to connect into a, one big object, okay? And that's when I'll say that there's actually a solid three-dimensional robust object there. Okay, lots of details that I'm not going over, but the story here is that I have a bunch of little stuff, local stuff, and I have some mathematical way to find a global picture, okay? I have a bunch of microscopic things, small scale things, and I have a way to identify a larger picture. Okay, all right. Abstract setup, graphs, intersections, vertices. Um, let's move on, okay? What I actually, what I'm going to do though is I'm going to have a tuning parameter lambda. So in place of these little balls, I'm going to say, let's look at the roads that are sufficiently fast or alternately sufficiently slow. Let's look at all of the roads in the network that are at least as fast as three miles per hour, or at, at most as slow as three miles per hour. Okay. So I want to look at a subgraph of the diamond district consisting only of roads which are of a certain speed or more or a certain speed or less. All right, that's the math. And whatever the math is doing, we can start to see a picture here. Let's look at the fast road. Okay? So these are the fast roads, namely the roads that are at least of speed four, and we see nine connected components. Okay. Well, if we look at roads which are at least of speed 3.5, um, that one and that one have connected, that one and that one have connected, and we're starting to see a whole bunch of other little roads appear, okay, because we're allowing slower roads. These are the fast roads, now we're including slightly slower roads, and then as we allow even slower roads, more roads appear, and some of these things have merged, um, and extended, and we're starting to see this story that you can go from southwest to northeast a little bit more clearly here, okay? If I allow even slower roads, things fill in even more, okay? and. Now I can see, well, lots of things are connected. If I am looking at roads which, have, which are 2.5 miles per hour or faster, okay? So if I'm a taxi driver who only drives, who really has a, you know, who's a speed demon, and he or she only wants to drive on roads that are 4 miles per hour or faster, they can't go too many places. Here, this is a slightly more relaxed taxi driver, who's willing to go on roads who are at least uh, speed 3.5. This is, you know, I mean, this 
a really relaxed taxi driver, right? I mean, you know, 2.5, they're willing to go on roads that are 2.5 or, or faster, right? Uh, then we continue on, and this is basically, this is a taxi driver with no standards at all, okay? They'll go on anything, all right? But you start to see what happens, this picture starts to fill in. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of, well, how many connected components there are. Nine. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, up to 14. Here we have all right, 10. Here we have a whole bunch of things. These things have, have combined. And now we have five connected components. And now there's two connected components. That's out there. Then the taxi driver with no standard, standards at all can is a whole big blob where he or she can drive anywhere. All right? We can keep track of those. All right? And basically, the horizontal lines are the different connected components. We'll keep track of them somehow. But what we start to see here, or what's interesting from a citywide perspective, is that around maybe 3.75, that's where we see a big change in connectivity. Okay? We see, you know, a big change right around here for connectivity. Okay? So now, with this sort of picture, we can think about, well, is Upper Manhattan better than Lower Manhattan? Is Chicago, how does Chicago, how does this picture for Chicago compared to a corresponding picture for Manhattan. Where does the connectivity break down? Okay, something like that. And here, this is where things merge. So at two, you know, that's when things start to really, everything combines into one, one blob and our taxi driver has no standards from here on, so to say. Okay, so, the picture here, the, the large scale picture is, can we understand connectivity, okay, of a, an urban traffic uh, network using these, this tool? Well, um, that's what I just said. We think that this is a promising story. Um, I've swept something under the rug here, we've assumed that, or we have not really paid attention to the direction of traffic here, okay? So I'm, I've uh, sold you a bill of goods a little bit. Um, we've sort of assumed that all roads are bi-directional in, for this case. The actual result when roads are one-directional, we're still working on that, but okay. Um, you can imagine in New York City that if Traffic is bad in this direction, it may, might also be bad in that direction, just because of people turning left or whatever, okay? Um, so, I think there's an interesting story here. Um, we're still working on it, but that's research, okay? All right, um, let's see. All right, so that was the first, uh, the first thing that uh, we started to do when with the mathematical tools of, of uh, Traffic. Second question, low rank approximation of traffic counts, okay? So, um, I'd like to use some matrix theory here, all right? So, has that, have any of you seen low rank uh, stuff in traffic behavior? Okay, all right, so let's, let's uh, go through this. So, what I want to do is I want to use sort of some Unsupervised machine learning, that's the buzzword to say here, but the math is actually math dating back to, you know, a long time ago. Um, I want to see if we can actually decompose traffic patterns in, or traffic behavior into a bunch of patterns, okay? And I told you we have some traffic estimates. Let's look at 2011, and basically we're going to look at the um, numbers of the D, the count of taxis or traffic or whatever on each link, okay? So basically at time T, three o'clock in the afternoon, and at link L, which is going to be Broadway between third and fourth, I have 10 taxis. 
according to my data set, then we can go back and talk about the data set, but let's use this as a start. Okay? So what? All right? So what I want to do is I want to take that matrix D and I want to decompose my matrix of traffic. So basically this says that there's two taxis at time three, or let's say eight taxis, at time three and link four. And I want to write this three by four matrix as a three by two matrix, namely a tall skinny matrix times a short fat matrix H. Okay? Now, I use the internal dimension 2. Okay? I could have said let's uh, maybe instead of two dimensions, let's have one dimension, but this was the slide that I wrote. I chose that it's uh, that this matrix is going to be 3 by 2. This is going to be 2 by 4. Okay? All right. Um the story that I want to think about is this is a time signature and I have some reference time signatures and I want to load these time signatures by people, let's say, to get my overall traffic behavior. Okay? Um, we'll talk about that in a moment, but let's see. That's right. The story here is that basically the first column, if you remember your matrix math, the first column here is this, okay? The second column is 2 times this, okay? The third column is this, and the fourth column is this plus that, okay? All right, simple matrix math, okay? So basically, one person is using this to get the, uh, this signature. Is that my next slide, actually? Uh, yes, it is, but let's maybe talk to it. Let's go through it here. So one person is using this signature to give me this traffic pattern on link one. On the other hand, one person is using this signature, and one person is using this signature to get me my overall traffic pattern on link four, okay? And you can think about these traffic signatures in obvious ways. I have some people who are going to work at nine o'clock in the morning and coming back, okay? At four o'clock in the afternoon. Another signature might be, well, people who, you know, are only work in the afternoon, all right? You might have a signature, a bunch of people are just heading for a coffee shop between nine and 11 in the morning. Okay, you might have another signature where people are going out at night. In New York City, you might have a signature where people are going to the theater district, right? Okay, so all of these signatures, we're adding together these signatures multiplied by the number of people who are using those signatures. Okay, and that's what I just said. Okay, um, maybe there's a sign signature for bad weather. Okay, a different signature for good weather. Um, and let's see, I guess we should be a little bit careful here. The data may be imperfect because it turns out, this was a fun little adventure, the shortest street in New York City is called Edgar Street. And probably no taxi ever goes to Edgar Street. It's just too short, okay? so. Maybe we don't actually have data for that, okay? All right, that's life. We just sort of forget about it, all right? And by the way, this is also, the math here is sort of similar to the Netflix problem of matrix completion. Informally, the idea is that Netflix takes what everyone is watching and sort of combines all the data and tries to do this matrix thing to realize that, well, this type of movie is an action movie, this type of movie is a romantic comedy, this type of movie is a thriller, well, this type of movie is both a thriller and a romantic, uh, and romantic, okay? So, you know, some movies are combinations of genres, okay? Some road behaviors are combinations of different types of signatures, okay? 
Um, math, okay, there's some novel things here. We won't really go over them. There's lots of references in all sorts of areas of math. All right, we have um, some interesting things going on here. Um, we won't focus on the math here, but we can phrase this as an optimization problem, okay? So we have the data D, we like to find W and find H, okay? So we don't know what they are. We are, however, requiring that both W and H be non-negative. We can't have negative people using a signature. So we can set up a math problem where we take a guess of W and H and we construct an error which tells us how far off we are. We can also add some other stuff which says that maybe we don't want our W's to be too large. We don't want to, you know, have a signature which says that we have nine million people on a road. That just sounds a little bit too weird. We can also be a little bit clever with optimization with our uh, math here, and we can use a lasso type uh, penalty here which says that basically any behavior is going to be used by only a smallish number of signatures. We might have a signature for winter, a signature for summer, and we really want to use only one of them, right? So there's a penalty here which sort of does that. Um, this story is we have just a whole universe of signatures. We're only using some of them, and there's some notion of sparsity which is clever with, you know, L1 and L2 norms, and okay, it's, let's not belabor that. Um, there's some math, just to make a convincing argument, argument that there is math. There's critical points because it's an optimization problem, and then we can do stuff, do stuff, do stuff. All right, and sort of works, and we can actually see some results here, okay? We can see that some <coughs> signatures are, uh, that looks, that signature isn't uh, anywhere else. This signature sort of goes up that road, okay? So the math sort of, on its own, sort of realizes that there's one behavioral pattern which is concentrated on that road, okay? And there's another behavioral pattern here, which is sort of well, similar, but it's sort of over here, right? A whole bunch of, I'm not quite sure what's there, um, but it sort of is all over the place, okay? So this signature is basically people doing lots of things all over the place. Um, we can turn around and actually convince ourselves that interesting things were happening. This left one is uh, Christmas, and we can and the right one is Hurricane Irene, and the red thing in the, in the uh, center is the average, and we can see that some, some things are basically seriously off there, right? Um, we're, we're not going to go into it, but that's a little bit more of a detailed story, but you can start to see that interesting things are happening. Christmas is pretty diverse, right? Um, what's actually interesting here, after all the math is done, is the error. Okay, so I can do all the math and I can approximate traffic behavior by a matrix decomposition, cool. I love math. But what's interesting is what happens if we look at the error? Okay, and the error between my data and my matrix approximation sort of tells me how orderly traffic is, okay? If I can completely decompose my traffic behavior into a matrix W times a matrix H, then golly, that traffic is pretty regular. On the other hand, if that matrix approximation isn't very good, then that means that there is, you know, the traffic is pretty chaotic. I can't approximate it in this way. So what we were interested in is, so well, there's, I've done some math, basically, I like this word sparsity as opposed to an abstract parameter, and we'll 
um, not belabor that point, but let's see. So this is fall, and okay. So on this one, let's see, on all of them, the, the, uh, the solid lines are, the, are a given season, and the dotted lines are the overall the yearly average, okay? So without delving too much into the details here, once again, the solid lines are, the, are, the, are for fall, the dotted lines are the yearly average. So it looks like fall is more disorderly, okay? Spring is less disorderly. Okay, here, once again, spring, no, so fall is more orderly, no, fall, fall is, sorry, fall is disorderly, winter is more orderly, spring similarly is more orderly, and summer is slightly more disorderly. Okay, so that's interesting to me. Okay, the seasonality, I have some idea of how, you know, which seasons are a little bit more chaotic, yeah? Is this, this data is still coming from the Diamond District? No, this is overall, this is all of Manhattan. Sorry, this is, this is all of Manhattan. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so, uh, the math here actually gives me some way of understanding disorder or lack of the ability to find a pattern. Okay, so you can, I mean, this is the sort of comparison that I'm interested in. You know, seasons, uh, which, what's going on? Okay, so that was our, our, second, uh, our, our second story. Our third one is time for accidents, okay? And we were interested in the following question. How much time would you give up, or would you have to give up, to be safer? All right, so um, let's see here. So, all right, we started with a with a mixture of data. We have uh, accidents. Okay, this is where accidents are in New York City according to our data set. Okay, this is where taxi trips start. This is where taxi trips end. We actually know that. The taxi trip which started there ended right there, let's say. We have the whole taxi trip. And we also, as part of our data set, have the pace, which is the reciprocal of velocity. Okay, so red means it's slow. Okay? All right, so we wanted to combine these data sets and answer the, or ask the question, see if we could understand the question, or the answer to the question, how much time would you have to give up to be safer? Okay, now, we want to be careful here. We aren't predicting accidents. We can't use this to route around accidents, okay? Accidents are often caused by people doing silly things on the road, and that's sort of unpredictable, sort of, kind of. I know that I've done some silly things on the road. Are there any of you who have not done silly and stupid things on the road? <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's what causes accidents. I'm not going to try to predict that. I'm going to try to analyze things for several reasons. First of all, well, let's see, what's my next slide? Okay, so several reasons for this. This is a historical analysis. So one thing is if I can do this for, let's say, New York City and Chicago, I might be able to understand that these trade-offs between accidents and time are different for the two cities, and then a city planner from Chicago would be able to say, oh, New York City has a better trade-off than I do. I wonder what I can learn from them, okay? If I were progressive insurance, I might also say, hmm, maybe I'm going to carefully look at how this person is driving and whether they are avoiding accident prone areas or whether they're seeking or whether they typically go through accident prone areas and maybe increase their premium. Okay? All right. So this notion of a trade-off between accidents and time is a historical one. Okay? Math, I have a whole bunch of costs. Okay? I want to look, along, look at the number of accidents 
along a path. I'm going to look at the trip length of the path, and I'm going to look at the trip duration of the path. Okay? I want to be a little bit careful up in the top because if I have, if I'm looking at morning rush hour, which is two ac two hours, and I have two accidents per hour, that's equivalent to well, two accidents in two hours is the same as one accident per hour. Okay, so I'm going to be a little bit careful there. Um, what I want to think about is a cost function which combines trip time and the number of accidents, okay? So, sort of the story here is that I have an internal parameter which says that I just need to get there in a hurry. I don't care how many accidents are sort of whether I'm going through an accident prone area, okay? On the other hand, if my mother, who's about 90 years old, were driving, I'd sort of like her to avoid the accidents, right? Okay, rather than, than uh, try to get there in a hurry, if my teenage child were driving, I mean, that's the same thing. So I have a parameter here which allows me to tune the preferences between accidents and time. Okay? Um, with a certain trade-off between accidents and time, I can find the best path. Okay? And uh, this is basically Dijkstra routing and so forth. There's zillions of, of uh, ways to find the best path. I'll say something mathematically novel in a moment, but, well, there's some clever thing about a Riemannian manifold and a cost that this cost function makes sense in some clever way. All right? Now, let's actually look at this from a normalized standpoint. Once again, I want to develop the ability or tools by which Chicago could compare itself to New York City. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, whenever I look at cost or time or number of accidents or length, I'm always going to normalize everything by the fastest path. Okay? All right, so if, you know, whatever number of accidents I might see along a certain path, I'm going to divide that by the number of accidents along the fastest path, okay? Because sort of kind of, in reality, we all want to get somewhere in a hurry, right? The uh, reasonable normalization is that's normalized by the what happens along the fastest path. Okay? All right. And you start to think that um, Whatever is going on here, there's some obvious trade-offs, okay? Um, if I try to avoid accidents, I'll probably be going on a longer path, okay? So there's some sort of monotonicity. As I increase my accident avoidance, I'm going to be wandering around a little bit more, okay? Um, the accidents per mile, that's a little bit trickier. Uh, okay, um, I'm also interested in not just me driving, but in order for Chicago and, and uh, New York to compare each other, we should consider sort of all trips, okay? So I'm sort of interested in, or rather, if only two people are driving along that road, I don't care about it, okay, compared to 700,000 people driving along this road. So what I actually am interested in doing is normalizing by all the trips in my data set and sampling, if you will. All right, so that road, which may have sort of statistically a number of accidents, but only three people drive along it, that's not going to count so much. And here we go. All right. When we do this, we can actually carve out a curve which says that in Manhattan, evening and morning, if I am willing to, um, 1.01, if I'm willing to, let's say, take 1% uh, more time, I can decrease accidents by 6%. Okay? If I'm willing to increase trip time by 2% in evening rush hour, 
I can decrease accidents by maybe 7.5%. Uh, and you can see that, well, evening and morning are safer. Because for a given amount of extra time, I can decrease my accidents evening and morning more than in the rest of the day. And morning rush hour, interestingly enough, is better than, uh, let's see, evening rush hour. Okay, so green, no, that's the other way around. Uh, the other way around. So the purple is lower than the green. Okay, so with purple, I can decrease my accidents more than I can in the morning. Okay, uh, that's sort of interesting. Um, let's see. Although I didn't put, yeah. This is based on the optimization problem you have defined, right? Because you cannot, in reality, you cannot validate this, right? Because. So I cannot. It's based on the optimization problem, I, problem and I'm not validating. I'm trying to give curves by which or a means by which to okay. compare. Sure. Yeah. All right? Yeah. So I'm willing to sort of, you know, look the other way on a little bit of the math so that I can actually come up with something that says, wow, purple is lower than green. Sure. That actually warrants a little bit more study. All right? Now, my normalization by the fa all my normalizations by the fastest path and everything, I didn't put it here, but we have, and I should put the slide, can compare all of Manhattan to Upper Central Manhattan. Okay, so we can see that, well, all of Manhattan actually is a little bit better than Upper Central Manhattan, in this case, because you can you know, paths that actually go through all of Manhattan, not just restricted to Upper Central Manhattan, but you could also envision comparing cities this way. All right? All right, so uh, there's some clever math here, which I won't go through. That's it. These are, these are the important people who did the real work. I just give the talks in Rand tool. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yes. Yes. So in this case, let's say this gives us an idea. Okay, evening, morning hours yeah. are better to avoid accidents. Let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, then in that case, let's say if we try to use those hours more. Will these curves change? And yes. So there, there is no feedback in this. Okay. okay. A. There are several things that one could think about. Okay. So a natural question would be: Okay, now that we know this, let's do something. All right, let's maybe uh, run some more buses along some paths, let's do whatever, change some traffic lights, whatever. And uh, first of all, we can now measure the effect of that. A model, however, would say, well, if we're doing something, maybe some of the people who are on accident prone roads are now going to move to less accident prone roads. That's sort of what we would like, but we're not doing that because for the moment, we're just trying to understand what the data says. We're not trying to build a model around the data which naturally would inv involve feedback. Yeah. So you were showing the results about some error? Yes. That was a slide. Yeah, uh, and you showed that like during the winter, it's the highest. That is the highest. Uh, so yes, the the uh, the winter is that's right. The the actually the winter the air is slightly smaller. Yeah, but but I, I was thinking like all of the main holidays and Thanksgiving. Oh uh, yeah, true, true. Um, we are hard to. Uh, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we didn't break that out. We could. I don't know. One could. Uh, Maybe, I, I, I don't know, one could maybe envision not so many people driving on those days, I don't know. And one can envision totally different traffic patterns, I don't know, uh, I don't know. And 
the idea is like on these days, uh, the pattern of travel is changing a lot through the years. It's all over the place, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the e-commerce and everything. So it's hard I mean, to... yeah, what happens at the New York City Marathon? I mean, yeah, right, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things going on, right? Uh, what happens right after a New York Knicks game, right? Uh, I think uh, at some point we saw, uh, saw the trace of a Taylor Swift concert or something. I, you know, I don't know, but you know, we, we uh, yeah, there are all sorts of crazy things happening. What we're interested in overall is large scale behaviors. Okay. Uh, where, did the, where did the flow data come from? Or like... Who's route of the, the number of cars on each road? Yeah. Well, okay, so that comes from this. Is it, is it the number of cars on each road or is it the flow of it's, cars? All right, so this story says that if I take a whole bunch of taxi data and I say that each taxi driver is trying to optimize his or her um, travel and I have a whole bunch of trips, I can probably reverse engineer not only speeds, but the number of taxis on each link at each time. But so you're, it's only taxis? It's only taxis. That's a proxy for overall behavior. It's a questionable proxy. Okay. okay. When, when Uber gives me all of their data, I can redo this. <laughs> I was, oh, I was going to say, I, was wondering if you, I wondered if you looked into, you gave the Diamond District yeah. example. So that, that's, the, that's the site of the Midtown in Motion program. So that whole area is ringed by detectors because they do okay. adaptive yeah. traffic signaling. So they know everything about what happens in that district. So this was in 2011. That was just something that yeah. caught my eye. But uh, yeah, if we'd have better better data, we could actually do this. Yeah, Midtown in Motion started yeah. in 2012. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, so how do you make sure that the traffic signatures that you find are actual traffic patterns and not just Spurious? something that I don't math works out. All right, so so there's several answers to that. Um, first of all, these are really big matrices. So um, I'm sort of assuming, admittedly, that with these big matrices and since these are people who are doing weird things that I'm not going to have anything that the math isn't going to produce anything spurious. The slightly more nuanced answer I think is the actual signatures themselves and we looked into some signatures that's why we got the uh, those things but what I think actually is interesting is this error. Okay, and just looking at this error, the, the answer then is, whatever the math does, it does. What I'm really interested in is how patternable is the data, all right? You have a question? Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I have a question about this uh, low rank decomposition. Yeah. So as you said, the matrix is so big, right? I assume that if you have the data for the trips in Manhattan for different times, it's going to be an extremely large matrix that you want to decompose. And I'm wondering, in terms of computation, how hard is it to do it? Is it done one at a time? Is it like an iterative process? My philosophy is the bigger the matrix, the smarter the graduate students I need. <laughs> um, it takes a And now I hear some people groaning, right? Um, it takes a while. There are some fast algorithms. What we're actually doing is an algorithm that, uh, all right, so there's a little bit of clever math here in that we want things to be non-negative. We can't have a negative number of people using a signature, so we sort of want a multiplicative rule, okay? Namely, give me a number, and as long as I multiply it by a positive number, it's still gonna remain non-negative, right? So. That means that the algorithm is a little bit careful. Um, I don't remember how long it took. It takes a while. We had a big-ish, but not massively big computer. Okay. We also, I think, did a little bit of some subsampling of data so that it wouldn't be, you know, years and years and years of computing. But at Illinois, you're not allowed to say we don't have enough computing power. <laughs> Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.